Jens Bongard, who's going to talk about causes of leaky gut and the metabolic and production consequences of it. Lance grew up on a mixed livestock and row crop farm in southwestern Minnesota. Lance received his BS and MS degree from the University of Minnesota and PhD from Cornell University. He joined the University of Arizona's Animal Science Department in 2001 and then joined Iowa State University in 2009 as the Norman Jacobson Professor of Nutritional Physiology in the Department of Animal Science. Baumgart's primary research emphasis has been on the metabolic and endocrine consequences of heat stress in growing and lactating animals. Please help me welcome Lance. Okay, can you hear me all right? I, uh, in the folder it says I was a, a Jacobson professor of dairy nutrition, and although I do some dairy work, I didn't want you to not come just because it has the word dairy in it. I, um, so anyway, I grew up on a, a very small, fair to finish hog farm right north of Okoboji, in between Worthington and Jackson, if you're familiar with where that's at. Okay, so I've had some um, key collaborators I just want to throw out right away. We have a pretty active team of Nick, John, Jason, Aileen, and Josh and I, and then a variety of graduate students. Uh, one that's in the room here, Johanna, and I should have had on there Rinkatesh Manny, because a lot of this work uh, he, he has spearheaded. Okay, so I got a lot of slides, so we gotta, we're going to go through this quickly, okay? So, but if you have questions, go ahead and stop me during the middle of the talk. I'm totally fine with that. The idea of the concept that gut health dictates overall animal health is not new, right? Uh, 400 years BC, we were talking about gut being the origin or the ep essentially the epicenter of, of animal health. I think we're getting a better appreciation for it now. I think at least when I, went to gra when I, when I was an undergraduate in graduate school, we thought of the GI tract's job as just simply to adjust and absorb, and that was pretty much it. And it's, it's clear now that it has a much bigger role in overall profitability than we used to give it credit for. So my group in particular has been looking at insults that cause leaky gut in both the ruminants and in the pig, pig side. And we first went down the pathway of, of heat stress. And my group doesn't necessarily study the mechanisms by which these insults cause leaky gut or impair, or impair the barrier function. We're more interested in once that barrier has become compromised, what are the, what are the consequences from a metabolism perspective, the hormonal perspective, and which I'll show you in a few slides, the immune system has its own unique metabolism that's markedly different than what we all had to memorize in biochemistry class back in the day. And then once these three different um, systems are altered, how they collectively then compromise productivity and profitability, okay? So we're going to talk about heat stress, but I'm um, also going to talk about off-feed events or feed restriction. Uh, Laura Greiner and I and Jason Ross have just started a project looking at the transition period of a sow. I think there's a lot of overlap between the poorly transitioning dairy cow and that poorly transitioning sow with regards to inflammation. And then we believe some of that inflammation is probably coming from the gut, We've started some mycotoxin work, which I won't talk about, and we are still remain very interested in hindgut acidosis. Anyway, the two I'm going to talk about today, though, just for the interest of time, is heat stress and feed restriction. Um, just a reminder about the gut. On here, this oversimplified picture is supposed to show villi, right? And these are, this is a, a strategy that the, the animal utilizes to maximize the surface area of the gut, and I'll emphasize the strategy uh, more in a few slides, but this would be a, a villi, and there might be a couple thousand different cell types that are lining that villi, right? And just like cell types on your skin, these the villi need to be connected. They're connected with these tight junction proteins, which I'm going to show you uh, a cartoon about in a second. But just imagine this is, this, this is a villi, and there might be a couple thousand interest, or cell types. Hopefully most of them, depending upon what segment we're talking about, are enterocytes or absorptive absorptive cells. So here's a couple of these cell types, and um, they make these tight junction proteins, they're called TGs, TJs, tight junction, TJs. Um, 
And there's at least 50 different types of tight junction proteins that we're aware of, and there's probably 50 more that we don't know about. And they're made within the cell, and they're embedded on the lateral side. And they reach out and they make a physical connection with their neighbors, tight junction proteins. Okay, and I like to, I like to envision it like a, like a zipper or like Velcro. Right? There's physically separating the outside world from the inside world. Okay, so this is just the cartoon showing what happens normally even in the most healthiest of animals. This green um, rectangle is supposed to represent a pathogen, which of course there's trillions of in our gut. And it's, this, it's just showing that it's replicating. And of course when a pathogen is replicating, it's releasing these toxins. That's okay if one of these pathogens gets through because the gut always has some degree of permeability. Right? This isn't a big deal. Um, it's because most of our immune system, which I'll talk about also in a few slides, resides in our gut. And that's fine. We, pathogens got in. We don't want that to happen, but if it does, as long as it's just a little bit, that's okay. We'll, we'll deal with the problem. We're going to communicate with the immune system and say, I have, a, I, have a, I have someone who's not supposed to be here. In will come as macrophages and neutrophils to take care of the problem. And the, and the healthy pig and the healthy human have no idea that something just went wrong. Okay? Just to reiterate, there's always some degree of leakiness in every animal. It's the extent of this leakiness that dictates whether or not you're going to have an immune response. Okay, so let's start off with the first insult on the gut, and uh, at least from our perspective, and that's heat stress. And the difference between the biology of heat stress is very different than the biology of, of immune activation or free body response. But I will show you by the end of the, end of the talk that a severely heat stressed pig not only has accumulated heat due to heat stress, but it's also having a free body response or an immune activation because of leaky gut. So the, the body temperature and the heat stressed pig is a combination of both, both sources of heat. And of course, we're interested in it for a variety of reasons, primarily money, right? It costs us a lot of money. Um, Steve Pullman, this was in 2010 or 2011, gave an invited talk at the Midwest meetings. And almost 10 years ago now, he estimated that it cost the American pig industry about a billion dollars a year, half in grow finish and half in repro. And who knows, it would be great if someone did that again, right? Because um, I suspect it's a lot more. And I like to tell our, gen our, our geneticists in the Department of Animal Science that it's double the impact of PERS. It's a huge issue, right? And forever we've always assumed that uh, heat stress is an engineering issue. The engineers need to build a better building or a better fan or a better system. And uh, maybe up until 10 years ago, I think everyone, yeah, this kind of was our assessment. But now we know that there's a lot of biology of heat stress that we might be able to take advantage of. Okay, it's, going to, it's already a huge issue. It's already a billion dollar problem. It's probably going to become a bigger issue in the future based upon genetics. Even if climate change isn't correct, right? Even if climate change isn't occurring, heat stress will become a bigger issue because all the phenotypes that are important to us are, gener are associated with increased heat. The more piglets the sow makes, the more lean tissue accretion the finisher has, the more heat they produce. So now, Right? And now it's just a physics issue, there's no biology here. The more heat you and I produce, the temperature at which we become stressed is going to, go, continue to go down. So our pigs are more sensitive than our grandfather's pigs were. And our grandchildren's hogs will be more sensitive heat than our hogs are. It's just a, that's just a physics issue. Okay. So, um, you, I, I don't need to probably spend much time on this slide, but when I, when I talk to producers, these are, these are the complaints I'm getting, or I hear about. Right? They just don't finish. It's almost impossible to get those last 15 pounds on them. Huge variability in market weight, which the packers hate, of course. Um, packers also complain about the issues of what's called flimsy fat. Right? So I had to learn all about this a couple years ago myself, but evidently after the pig's killed and it's hanging, it's cooled down, and that, that fat hardens. The, that the hardness of that fat then allows them for the cuts to be processed. And then when pigs go to market in the, uh, the heat of the summertime, that fat becomes flimsy and it gives them headaches in the processing. And we've got a paper out just a couple of months ago that that's not a fatty acid desaturation issue, it's a water, water holding capacity issue of the, of the lipid. The, the, the fat contains more water than it should. And of course, seasonal infertility, weaned estrus, failure to express estrus, slip litters about 30 days post 
AI. Uh, they can die, and oftentimes it's pigs, the heavy pigs, the pigs with the most biggest investment in the barn. You know, we talked about feed efficiency a lot. In fact, almost the, the inconsistencies in how heat stress affects pure feed efficiency, when I say pure, just simply gain over weight or feed intake, is highly inconsistent. And sometimes we actually see an improvement in feed efficiency during a heat stress experiment. So I think efficiency is a big problem, but not necessarily feed efficiency. It's simply a production efficiency, right? If it takes 10 more days to finish, right? So it's more of a barn efficiency rather than a purified classic feed efficiency perspective. Okay, so um, I was working on heat stress in Arizona, but from, with dairy cows and moved up here to Ames in 2009. And um, we started to look at heat stress biology from obviously from a pig perspective. And one of the things that grabbed my attention right away was that we know that when you feed restrict a thermal neutral animal, when you, when you feed restrict a thermal, thermal neutral animal, they will, they, will, um, they will try to emphasize lean tissue accretion and de-emphasize fat accretion. They essentially get leaner. Okay, so feed restricted thermal, thermal neutral animal gets lean at the expense of fat, but a heat stressed animal, not just pigs, but chickens and rodents too, when they get hot, right, they, be, they accumulate more lipid, more animal, more fat than energetically predicted. Does that make sense? So a feed restricted animal is, oh, sorry, a heat stressed animal is set in, in essentially a, a, a feed restricted animal. They voluntarily go on feed restriction, but the consequences to lipid and lean accretion are very, very different between the two. So that was a, that was a huge, I guess, aha moment for us back in 2009. It's like, wow, this something's obviously, heat stress is having huge impacts on, on metabolism that have nothing to do with, re, with reduced feed intake, okay? So um, we set up these experiments. We always use what we call a pair feeding model. We heat stress a group of pigs. They will voluntarily go off feed. We measure that reduction in feed intake, and we implement that same level of feed restriction to a group of thermoneutral pigs, right? So you have two groups of pigs. One's hot, one's not, but feed intake is paired, it's the same. Um, which I think is incredibly important, right? There's been hundreds of heat stress experiments done in cattle and in pigs and chickens for years, but one group of heat stress animals is eating 40% less than the thermoneutral animals. So now we're, it's like comparing apples and oranges, right? You... Okay, so the, this is daily feed intake. This is one of Sarah Pierce's very first experiments when she was a master's degree in my, master's student in my, pro, in my, in my program. We had thermoneutral pigs, heat stressed pigs, and pair fed thermoneutral pigs. I don't know if you can see that in the back, it might be too small. But the thermoneutral pigs were consuming about two kilograms of feed intake per day. The heat stressed pigs uh, have an immediate reduction in, in feed intake within the first 24 hours. And then by design, the pair fed thermoneutral pigs have a similar uh, extent and magnitude of feed intake reduction, okay? So all the data I'm going to show you with regards to the gut or to metabolism has nothing to do with animals on different planes of nutrition. Okay, so we totally hypothesize that the pair-fed animals would do better than the heat-stressed animals, right? You'll, you'll see a pattern here that none of our hypotheses actually end up being correct. The thermoneutral pig in that one-week time frame gains a little over seven kilograms of body weight. The heat stress pig gains about a, a kilo and a half or almost two kilograms of body weight. The pair fed thermoneutral pig, consuming the same exact quantity of feed that the pair fed pigs are consuming, lost almost four kilograms of body weight, a little over three. So in a seven day time frame, seven days, consuming the same quantity of feed, one group of the, the differences in body weight were almost five kilograms. So the energetics of that, right, for the, for the nutritionists in the room, like, holy cow, how can this be? Two groups of animals consuming the same exact body, uh, quantity of, of, of feed intake, have a difference at the end of seven days of five, almost five kilograms of body weight. So clearly, the energetics uh, and the bioenergetics of heat stress is very large. And we think in large part it's due to this strange insulin response. This is... Uh, 
insulin on the left and C-peptide, which is a better marker of insulin secretion, on your right. Despite the fact that the pigs have gone off feed and they're losing, uh, you know, they're, they're in a catabolic state, insulin concentrations are higher compared to the pair fed them neutral hogs. And this transcends species, cattle, uh, rodents, humans, even snakes. If you heat stress a critter, right, its feed intake will go down, sometimes they'll stop eating, and insulin levels will go up. And the, the, this is incredibly strange, right, because insulin is the most anabolic hormone that we know of. It's the most acutely anabolic hormone that we're aware of, and it, it should be responsive to feed intake. Right, we just had lunch. If you had any carbohydrates in that lunch, you are now digesting that sugar, becoming hyperglycemic, your pancreas is in, recognizing it, and it's releasing insulin. Insulin then is the, is the signal to store the nutrients that you just had for lunch in muscle and the adipose tissue. Heat stress is different. Feed intake goes down, insulin levels go up. It's, we'll get back to it later, why that is. Okay, just a quick review on the GI tract. Students especially have a hard time wrapping their heads around this concept that everything inside your GI tract remains outside of your body. 99% of what we just had for lunch is not in you yet. Right? Think of, I, I, I tell kids, you know, think of the GI tract as we're like an inverted donut. Animals are. Right? And the things inside of your gut are not part of you until you absorb it. Most of our food that we just had for lunch is in our stomach, hasn't reached our, has, haven't even reached our du uh, duodenum yet. And of course, we as nutritionists think of the GI tract's primary job is to digest and absorb valuable nutrients. And clearly that's an important part of a GI tract. But if you were a hardcore immunologist, you might argue that no, the bigger job of the GI tract is to prevent unwanted molecules from getting in. There's seven trillion bugs in our gut, seven trillion. We have many more billions of, of bugs in our gut than we do cells in our body. So who's the host here, right? We're just carrying around a bunch of bugs. Um, if they get in, they're gonna cause an immune response. So you gotta, the, the, the GI tract has an incredibly important job. Incredibly important. Digest and absorb valuable nutrients while simultaneously keeping seven trillion bugs out. It's not just bugs, of course. You have acids and enzymes and parasites that want to get in. Okay, I also don't think most, most people, and especially students, have an appreciation for how big our gut is. This is a human example, okay? the human GI tract. So there's a variety of different epithelia in our body. Skin, lungs, GI tract are all different epithelia. And a, a female animal would have two more, um, the uterus and the mammary gland are both epithelia. Okay, so we're all familiar with the skin, the size of our skin, and uh, the lungs are about 50 times that the size of our skin. But because of those villi and the microvilli that stick out of top, the size of our GI tract is enormous. You know, I said think of the GI tract like a garden hose running from the mouth to the anus. Well, that's a pretty poor example. You couldn't pick, up, you, you couldn't pick it up and see through it, of course because you have the mucosal folds for one, on top of the mucosal folds, that, of course that increases the surface area, then you have the villi, which markedly increases the surface area, then you have those little finger-like projections are on top of, called the microvilli. And collectively then, these adaptations make our GI tract surface area huge. So if you laid out a human's GI tract uh, on the ground, it'd be about the size of a doubles tennis court. So remember, there's seven trillion bugs trying to get in, and you have to defend an enormous, enormous area of surface. So it's no wonder then that an animal's immune system evolved out of our gut about a million and a half or 10, 15 million years ago, whatever. And to this day, our immune system, most of it resides in our gut. It's massive. And that's where the majority of the potential antigens reside. And to make matters worse, right, we're constantly trying to help the barrier function of our skin. We take showers, right? If, 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 if you get a cut, you might put a bandage on it. You may even put some antibacterial cream on it, right? The, the gut never gets that chance. 
from the day the animal is born to the day it dies, it doesn't get to take a shower or get cleaned up, right? It's constantly exposed to, to bugs its whole life. Okay, so why is the gut important, especially with regards to heat stress? It's because it's markedly affected by heat. When you and I go to the gym, uh, you go to the beach, you bale hay, you're moving hogs in the middle of J uh, July, you get hot. What's the color of our skin become? It becomes red. Why does our skin become red when we accumulate heat? What are you trying to do? You're trying to get rid of heat, right? So you vasodilate at the skin. That allows us then to try to maximize radiant heat dissipation. But if you're going to vasodilate an enormous tissue like the skin, you have to vasoconstrict somewhere else. This has to be coordinated. You can't have vasodilation everywhere. If you did, you'd be dead. And the gut constricts. And the blood flow to the gut constricts about 50%. But I'll show you in a second, the cells lining that epithelia, the gut, are incredibly sensitive to hypoxia, reduced blood flow. And in fact, when people die from heat stroke, right, they die typically the next day. So when you, if you suffer from heat stroke, right, and your eyes go back and you've lost consciousness and you're, you're out of it, someone gets you to the ER and they'll throw you into a bathtub of ice water and maybe give you some saline. That's, that's, that's what we do. Right? That's all we know what to do. And your body temperature will come back down and your eyes will roll forward and you'll, you'll gain consciousness again and you think you've just dodged a bullet. Well, you may die the next tomorrow, right? From severe leaky gut-induced endotoxemia that causes multiple organ failure. Remember about 10 years ago, the Viking offensive lineman, Corey Stringer? He died in Mankato, right? He died about 18 hours later once he got to the hospital. They, they cooled him down. He just, it's a, long, it's a bad way to go, right? Can you want to go home, and the doctor says, oh, you're probably going to the morgue. It's not good. Okay. So again, here's these two cells, um, and don't worry about the biochemistry, that's not important, but for, for some reason, when, these, when we don't know why, when these two cells become stressed, it could be heat, could be osmotic, could be oxidative, and I'll, talk, I'll show you in a second, even psychological stress, will cause those tight junction proteins to be pulled back into the cells that made them. They're still there, they're just not neat where they need to be. Now you no longer have a physical barrier separating the outside world, and you allow endotoxins to get in. And hopefully the local immune response will take care of the issue. If it doesn't, it goes via the portal blood to the liver. Okay? Again, if you're an immunologist, you'd argue that the liver... How much time do I got here? Yeah. All right? Uh, the liver will, will clear that endotoxin. But if the liver can't clear that endotoxin, now it goes uh, systemic. All right? And that's, that's what I'm talking about, the endotoxemia-induced multiple organ failure dying. Okay. So if it first gets through, the, the, the first line, of, well, here's the physical barrier of the gut. If LPS gets through, it's attacked by this thing called LPS binding protein, which will deliver the LPS to a macrophage. In this case, a Kupfer cell to deliver for detoxification. But in the process of doing so, there's this cytokine and acute phase protein response, uh, which I'll talk about these in the next few minutes. So um, one of the things that we study in the lab is called lipopolysaccharide. It's made by gram-negative bacteria. And because it's made by gram-negative bacteria, what that means is, is that it's everywhere, right? It's on your skin, it's on your pen, it's on your shoes. It's completely through your, uh, through your uh, GI tract, starting in your mouth and going into your anus. That's fine. It ends up in your toilet, hopefully. Your pig's manure, hopefully. But if your barrier function is compromised, now that LPS has an opportunity to get in. And when it gets in, it causes an immune response. An immune response that every single one of us in, in this room has familiarity with. Right? You lose your appetite, you get a fever, you feel sluggish, right? you, got to, you just don't feel good. Well, so this is what villi of the ilium uh, should look like, hopefully in your ilium. The villi are long and they're slender. This is in a thermoneutral ad libitum fed pig. This animal is trying to maximize the surface area of its gut. The hallmarks of a, a healthy gut are long, slender villi. Okay? The destruction in the... In the and the heat stress pig is, is obvious. But even what, what initially surprised us, if you just simply pair feed the pig, the only insult is being off feed by 50%. That will cause damage to the gut, illustrated by the shortened fatter villi. Right? So this, the only insult is a feed restriction, and this 
causes architectural changes that are, that are hallmarks of an of a impaired or unhealthy gut. And I'll show you some blood data right now to, to support that. Um, sorry, in, in a second I'll show you that. This is, but it happens quickly. This is some work from Sarah Pierce's uh, master's work where we looked at looking at um, endotoxin, which is the right axis with time, two, four, six, 12 hours of heat stress in a pig. And you'll see within two hours there's already a circling increase in jugular vein LPS. I'm emphasizing the jugular vein because remember, local, the, the local immune response should take care of that LPS. If that, doesn't, is that, if that isn't able to do it, well then hopefully the liver does. If the liver can't do it, now it goes systemic. And what my point is, we're picking up a, a doubling of circulating jugular vein LPS within two hours. So the GI tract is incredibly sensitive to, to, to hyperthermia. Okay, what about feed restriction or off-feed off events? I'll set up this experiment because it, it's still amazing to me. Um, so the, the pigs were heat stress for 12 hours. Okay, that's a 12 HS treatment. They were heat stress for 12 hours. And then of course we have thermal neutral pigs being fed ad libitum. And that's, we, we set their units to one. Now, the increase in circling LPS after 12 hours didn't surprise us. We totally anticipated that. But what is shocking to me was that just simply 12 hours of pair feeding, you'll get almost a four-fold increase in circling LPS, statistically not even different than the heat stress. Right? So 12 hours of, of pair feeding. When I say pair feeding, I'm talking about a 50% reduction in feed intake. Not feed withdrawal, just 50%. Now obviously everyone in this room probably has seen a pig that's been feed withdrawal or feed restricted for 12 hours. See, they're visibly anxious, they're visibly upset, right? They're, they're barking like dogs, they're trying to jump out of their individual pens, they're clearly not happy, right? And I'm emphasizing the, the emotional part of that here in a second. Actually the experiment was, um, being, they were also the, the heat stress pigs were fed a, a zinc sulfate or a, a diet containing avela zinc from Zinpro. And there was a marked improvement when they were on the Avela zinc. That's not the story. The story I want to talk about now is emotional stress. And I, I'm, not, I'm not a tree hugger, okay? But probably every one of us in this room has some familiarity with being psychologically stressed in our gut. I have a nine-year-old son who plays hockey and a six-year-old daughter with gymnastics. And before events, before games, they both complain about their stomach being in knots. They're nine years old, six years old. Why would they... Right? And some people get so stressed at public speaking or a big exam, whatever it is, when you get stressed, right? And some people get so stressed you get diarrhea or you get vomiting, right? Or you get knots in your belly or butterflies in your tummy. That's not in your head. It starts in your head, but that's real biology. And I'll show you to you this next slide. So there are these mast cells. We're all familiar with mast cells because uh, of a rash. You get a, you get a rash. Mast cells in your skin epithelia are releasing histamine. And that's causing you to have a rash. You don't like it, so you take a what? Antihistamine, right? Most of the mast cells in your body, they'll reside right under the epithelia of your, of your gut, not your skin. They're right here. And when you get stressed, now remember back to endocrinology class, when you get stressed, your hypothalamus releases this hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRF. That causes your pituitary gland to release what? ACTH. ACTH causes your adrenal gland to release cortisol, right? That's the stress response that we all had to memorize back as seniors. Well, it turns out these mast cells have corticotropin-releasing factor receptors. And when you get emotionally stressed, you signal to your stomach. These mast cells then release their granulas that's containing histamine, serotonin, proteases, TNF-alpha, and now these enterocytes pull those tight junction proteins back in. They're still there, they're just not where they need to be. And what do you feel? Butterflies or knots in your stomach. That's, that's real biology that we're just now starting to recognize. In fact, Adam Mosier at Michigan State's the one who's characterizing this the best. Right, so it, it is the reason why. Is that really that bad of a joke? <laughs> I thought that would get a laugh. No, evidently not, okay. So why, why would heat stress, and I didn't show you the data, but if you feed restrict an animal, there's also an increase in circulating insulin. If you cause an animal to have leaky gut, there's this increase in circulating insulin. Why? 
Well, let me show you. Here we give IV LPS to pigs. So IV LPS, the pig gets diarrhea, it vomits within the first 10 minutes, completely stops eating, completely stops eating. And look at insulin. Within one hour of time, there's almost a five-fold increase in circulating insulin, despite the fact that it has not con consumed a gram of feed. Okay? Oh, and by the way, glucose concentrations don't do much. They go down a little bit, but not nearly as much as they should. So let's talk about this evolution of the immune system's metabolism. There's a guy named Otto Warburg. He was a professor in Germany back in the 30s. He wins the 1931 Nobel Prize for discovering two things. Cancerous cells before turning cancerous can burn any type of fuel. Glucose, a lot of fatty acids, amino acids, etc. But once they become cancerous, most cancer cells prefer to only burn glucose. Immune cells, very similar. Before they're activated by an antigen, the resting immune cell can burn any type of fuel. But once activated by an antigen, its fuel selection only becomes glucose. Right? And he wins the 1931 Nobel Prize. He was a PhD advisor for a young punk named Hans Krebs. Krebs cycle. <laughs> and he was drinking buddies with uh, Albert Einstein. So what a, what a group of guys, right? Um, anyway, so we made a little cartoon based upon the Warburg effect, it's called, which is still heavily studied today in biochemistry. So the resting immune cell brings in glucose, but it could be bringing in amino acid or a fatty acid. It can burn anything. Brings it down through glycolysis, then brings it into the Krebs cycle for e e production of efficient ATP. What's 36, 38 ATP per mole of glucose, whatever it is. This is a very efficient process, but it's a lumbering slow process. Okay? Very efficient, slow. Where more, once the animal gets, a, uh, once the cell becomes activated by an antigen, it doesn't have time as a commodity. It needs to have ATP and other and other intermediates quickly. So it brings, despite this is not an this is not an anaerobic process. There is oxygen there, but it brings in now only glucose. Doesn't bring it down to the Krebs cycle. It brings it through glycolysis. This generates only two ATP, but it generates it very quickly. Okay, and that's why in animals that are infected have increased levels of lactate. And oh, by the way. Guess what this activated immune cell, what hormone it needs? Insulin. Has to have insulin for it to get its fuel. Okay, how much glucose is the immune system using? Who cares, right? If it's just a small number, really, what, what, of all the cells in the body, the immune system is really probably less than, what, 0.1% of all the cells in the body? So who cares if it's, how much? That's the question. We might, what's what we wanted to have? You're getting, we're getting five minutes? Okay. How much is the, is the immune system using? Well, it's a difficult to answer because there's immune cells everywhere. Right? If you wanted to determine how much the spleen was using, you catheterize the artery going into the spleen, you catheterize the vein leaving the spleen, and you can calculate how much glucose the spleen is using. You can't do that with the immune system because it's everywhere. It's in your big toe. It's in your brain. You can't isolate it, right? So you give an LPS challenge, they become hyperglycemic for about three hours. Then they become hypoglycemic, and they become hypoglycemic because... When an animal gets sick, the liver makes more glucose, muscle stops using glucose, and so does adipose tissue. These are our strategy that we want to partition glucose towards the immune system. But once that immune system gets going and totally, fully engaged, now these other systems that are employed to provide the glucose for the immune system can't keep up, and they become hypoglycemic. So we did what's called an LPS euglycemic clamp. We just simply by infusing glucose, don't give them the opportunity to become hypoglycemic. And then at the end of the 12 hours, we can calculate it. So it's pretty easy. You know, here's the catheterized pig. It's hooked up to a pump, which you don't see as a bottle of, sh of, of glucose. And we give it LPS, we measure the glucose, and then we change the infusion rates on the pump. It's a, it's a beautiful experiment because the number, the, the you don't got to go back to the lab and some, do some fancy witchcraft with molecular biology. The number's right on the pump. And we did, on this particular experiment, we did it for six hours, right? And if we translate this 116 grams to a day, 
It's over a pound. Remember, there's 454 grams of glucose in a pound. And this pig was only weighing, uh, what, 50 kilos or something. Right? 600 grams of glucose is an enormous amount of energy. Okay, let's extrapolate that. If, 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 that, if that pig was severely infected for three straight days, it'd be 1.8 kilograms of glucose. And remember, she stopped eating, so where's she going to get that glucose from? Gluconeogenesis. And John, patience, helped me with the math, and I said, okay, let's just pick a round, nice round even number. What's to say that a, a pig gets sick and its immune system for that entire sickness required 1,000 grams of glucose? Help me, you know, and he helped me do the math. It'd be 1.3 kilograms of skeletal muscle synthesis. Right? 1.3 kilograms of skeletal muscle synthesis. And we've done this in steers, pigs, and cows. It's, I don't, when you put things on a, on a metabolic body weight basis so you can compare apples to apples, I don't think it's a coincidence that the number is always about one gram of glucose per kilogram of metabolic body weight. Transcend species. The immune system is expensive. And remember, when, she gets, when he or she gets sick, the priority of the immune system is almost as high as the central nervous system. Making muscle or a fetus or a piglet or making milk is just simply no longer their primary concern. So can we do anything about it? Well, I don't have time to talk about it, but I think this is a massive market opportunity. Massive. So there's a variety of stressors, which I've talked about uh, off-feed events and heat stress, but I think there's a variety of other ones. I think a lot of them come down to the psychological, and ultimately between the decrease in feed intake and this activated immune system, it just simply requires an enormous amount of nutrients. And um, at the end of the day, I think the, the epicenter, the origin or the epicenter of reduced, feed, or reduced productivity in the summer months is at the gut. Everything, in my opinion, starts at the gut. And if you can prevent the gut from becoming permeable or hyperpermeable, I think all the negative downstream events can be at least ameliorated. Maybe not avoided, but ameliorated. So, Heat stress is a problem. It costs everyone, large and small producers alone, and the origin is the gut. And most of what I talked about here today was, paid, was funded by the Pork Checkoff and the Iowa Pork Association and some very key companies within the industry, uh, Zimpro and Elanco being two of them. But there's a variety of companies that have been, have been funding. The students did most of the work. Johanna sit right, right here. I see some alumni is here as well. So. Um, that's going to be in a couple hours and hopefully some beer with it. And I'll be glad to take some questions if you have them, if I have time. <laughs> Do we have time or not? We have time for one or two questions. Yeah. I know a lot of times in the summertime, we increase energy level of diet. Yep. Yep. But have you looked at reducing heat increment? Great question. Uh, the question was. Other than increasing the energy diet, energy in the diet, have you looked at uh, the heat increment? So we did a big project, funded by the IPP or the uh, Iowa pork producers, where the hypothesis is that, of course, high fiber diets should be avoided in the summertime because they generate so much heat. So we did a fairly large experiment with ah, 40 or 50 hogs per treatment, two different levels of fiber, and didn't see anything. So I, it makes me wonder if these dogmas that we have in our industry, I mean, they make, energetically they make sense, but I'm just not 100, they need to be tested. Because with 50 hogs per treatment, it was a, and we did episodes, four day heat waves, and we did three of them to try to mimic a Iowa summer day. Didn't see it. Stress. Yes. Is, is, is this an oxidative stress uh, cascade that's going on? So I think there's a variety of stressors at the epithelial cell itself that can do this. Oxidative stress is one of them, which we know there's oxidative stress at the gut in, during heat stress. Um, osmotic stress. Um, heat itself. Psychological stress. So uh, yeah, I think antioxidants can be part of that summer strategy. Thank you.